after the birth of Jesus, the three wise men, or magi, follow the star of Bethlehem to find the manger where Jesus was born. The Three Kings Day is celebrated on January 6th. This so happens to be the beginning of the Mardi Gras season, a season that lasts all the way up to Ash Wednesday at the beginning of Lent. Last Friday, we started our part one on the history and origins of Mardi Gras. And today, we're going to be finishing it up with part two. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. As always, a very, very special thank you to all of our patrons and our producers. We truly, honestly, could not do this without you. We are a grassroots channel. We don't have a production team or anything like that behind us. We're just citizens living in Atlanta, Georgia, putting our stories together, putting our information together for you guys to look at. So your support means the world to us. If you would like to join our Patreon community, there is a link down in the description box below. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce and today we're going to conclude part two on our deep dive into the celebration of Mardi Gras. Now before we go into our story and into our deep dives, just a few notes moving forward. We're on really uncertain times right now, the timeline, the month that we're in, anything could happen at any point in time. I'm actually filming this video on Wednesday the 11th, so this video will release on, you guessed it, Friday the 13th. Normally I like to get the videos in about a week in advance just for YouTube to screen them to make sure we're okay to try to keep the channel up. However, there's been so much going on with all these interviews that I've been so lucky to be a part of that I haven't had a chance to film this yet. That's why I'm filming it two days in advance instead of a week in advance. Now Friday the 13th when this will air, as this is airing, I will be doing a couple of calls. My first call will obviously be with Tom Numbers, a great friend of the channel, and Elizabeth from TikTok, and a new truther, Christy, which you guys got to meet Christy yesterday in an interview that I did with her. I'm also going to be doing another call with Tamara on Friday the 13th as well that will probably air to you guys on Saturday. So in real time as you're watching this, it will air tomorrow. She is going to go over some mantras for you guys, especially since there's total chaos right now in our world. Now on Monday, I will be recording with the channel Aquarius Rising Africa, which I'm super, super excited about. We're gonna be talking again about bloodlines, which is a subject that I'm very fascinated in, as you guys know. So if you are a part of their channel, please make sure you tune in for that episode with them. Now with all this being said, we know that there are whispers of things going on, potentially with the EBS system, maybe Maybe today on Wednesday as I'm filming, maybe in the future, we know that the New York City governor just resigned. So much is happening and I will try to stay up to date with the current events as well as the deep dives that we are doing on this channel. If major things do start to happen, what I plan on doing is pausing the deep dives to be able to do Zoom calls with other truthers around the world just so we can all kind of stay together and in the moment of what's happening. And then once everything happens and we can take a deep breath, we'll resume our deep dives again so we can start to figure out where they've manipulated stuff in the past if that makes sense. If nothing happens spectacular today or tomorrow, then as always, we will continue with our regularly scheduled program. But I just wanted to keep you guys up and in the loop because obviously stuff is just really exciting and popping off every day. And so we just kind of have to wait and see where the dust settles and what's going to be going on in the next few weeks. I know you, most of you watching like me are probably super ready 
for everything to flip. I'm, I've been ready. I think most of us have been ready for well over a year. But just hold the line. It's all coming and the best is truly, truly yet to come. I also just got a chance to look through some of the comments from Wednesday's video, which is today, the day I'm filming, about possibly doing a deep dive into tarot cards. You all seem super excited to do that. So I will be adding that to the list. And once we get through a couple more subjects, we will definitely I'll definitely start researching that for you to put together kind of a storyboard for you all to understand where they've manipulated us when it comes to like you know the taboo subjects that the church wanted us to stay away from which now we know we shouldn't have been staying away from because it is a tool given to us by God. And again, as I said on Wednesday, the next book that we're going to be diving into in our banned book series is the book of Tobit or it's also called the book of Tobias. So I'm gonna let you know that ahead of time in case you wanna go ahead and get your own copy if you wanna read it along with us. Uh, Wednesday's episode, I will be doing kind of a breakdown of the history of the book and then starting the book as well. Of course, it's always a recap of what we do on Tuesdays on the Dark Outpost. All right, without further ado, let's get started in the conclusion of our deep dive into Mardi Gras. If you did not see part one of Mardi Gras, we talked about the origins of the celebration, which actually comes down to the celebration of Dionysus. And in that video, we broke down the fact that we can speculate that Dionysus was probably a Nephilim or a giant. I will link that video down in the description box below if you missed it. Again, I want to say that in my opinion, in my humble opinion, as a human being living on this planet with all of you, I think a lot of times good and evil come down to the process of intention. Unless you're actually physically or emotionally and mentally hurting somebody on purpose, as we know a lot of these um, CULT members that are a part of the dark C-U-L-T do in some of these celebrations, then I believe you can actually make these celebrations good. So again, if you're not doing anything nefarious and you're just out there having a good time with your friends and family and you have the love of God in your heart, I don't think that we need to throw the baby out with the bathwater. This is the same opinion I have of like Christmas, uh, Valentine's Day, which we have done a deep dive on Valentine's Day. Somebody asked about that. I will put that link down in the description box below because that video also plays into Mardi Gras as well, which we'll get to. But again, Mardi Gras is so ingrained into the New Orleans culture that it's not something for me anyway that I would want to see ripped away from the people of New Orleans because it possibly has a nefarious origin story. I think that we, the people, have the ability to change it, to make it something fun, something good. Wherever there is love and laughter, God is present. But with that being said, in this deep dive today, finishing up our study of Mardi Gras, we are going to be talking about where these things come from, some of these traditional celebrations that we see in the Mardi Gras season. And of course, they do come from a very dark history. So as I said in the opening, the Mardi Gras season starts on January 6th, which is the Three Kings Day. It's the day that the Magi allegedly got to Jesus by following the star of Bethlehem. Now, we do know that Jesus was not born during Christmas. We know that Christmas itself is a Saturnalian holiday, and the new year being January 1 is not the new year that God created for us, but rather a celebration of the god Janu. I will link that video again down in the description box below. Now, one of the biggest parts of the Mardi Gras celebration is the king cake. Now, I am a huge fan of cakes. I have a big time sweet tooth. So anytime there's cake involved, I'm down. So I'm going to go over the story of the king cake as far as the story that they want us to believe. And then we're going to break it down and look at its potential dark heritage. So again, the king cake is a cake that's kind of like a cinnamon roll. And the icing of the cake or the sugar on the cake has the colors green, yellow, and purple. These are the traditional colors of Mardi Gras. Now, green represents faith. Purple represents justice, and gold represents power. 
Now, most people are probably aware, especially if you live in the United States, that within the king cake, there's typically a plastic baby. Very interesting, right? Now, if you were to get the slice of cake that has the baby in it, that was supposed to foretell good luck for you within this next year. This also means in many traditions that you will be the one responsible for providing the king cake next year. But again, why is there a baby in the king cake? Well, many people will tell you that this represents the baby Jesus. And the baby is hiding in the king cake, just like baby Jesus and other babies hid from the wrath of King Herod. But of course, like most things, what they tell us is not necessarily the truth. Sometimes it's a manipulated truth and sometimes it's a flat out lie. From what I can find in the 19th century, so the 1800s, there was a crew or a mystic society, which we're gonna get to, called the Twelfth Night Revelers. Now, remember, Dionysus was the god of revelry from our episode last week. Well, apparently this crew started putting beans inside of their king cake. And the story goes that whoever got the bean inside their slice of cake would go on to be the king or the queen of Mardi Gras. Allegedly, this bean then turned into possibly an almond or even a piece of jewelry as the time went on. And then the story goes, the story that they want us to know, that in the 1950s, that bean or almond or piece of jewelry turned into a plastic baby. This is because during the 1950s in the bakery called McKenzie's in New Orleans, a baker was duped into buying an overload of plastic babies from a traveling salesman. And thus, this baker started putting these little plastic babies inside of the cakes instead of there being a bean or an almond or some jewelry. And this tradition caught on, and here we are in modern times, and all the king cakes have this plastic baby in them. Well, it doesn't take much to do further research to see that this story might not be true. In fact, in my opinion, it's not true at all. It's just a facade. Because there are other stories of cakes back in Europe, especially France, where the celebrations really started, where they were putting plastic babies inside of their cakes. Now, for the average good-hearted person, this could definitely be a representation of Jesus. But if y'all remember back a few months ago, we again did a huge deep dive on the House of Bourbon back in France. In the House of Bourbon, Louis XIV being the very famous monarch from the House of Bourbon, where we get the name Louisiana from, the land of Louis, the House of Bourbon was notoriously known and caught up in a lot of scandals involving Satanism back in Paris. Once again, all of those videos are down in the description box below in case you miss them. But if we go back even further from the House of Bourbon to the House of Valois and its queen, the last queen of this house, Catherine de Medici. If y'all remember from the deep dive we did on Catherine de Medici, the Italian queen who married into the French family, who was from a very powerful banking family, just like the Rothschilds today, had a lot of scandals surrounding her involving Satanism. In fact, it was King Henry IV of France, mother, who wrote letters to Catherine regarding rumors that she ate, that she herself was a Now, before the Great Awakening, this information might have seemed a little odd and maybe just ancient gossip. But now, we know a thing or two about a thing or two. That's the thing about the Great Awakening. We wake up and we wake up greatly. Apocalypse again means to lift the veil. The veil has been lifted and we see the truth for what it is. So I speculate that the king cake got its name not from the three magi who went to visit 
the Christ child, but from the monarchy of France itself and their habit of, you guessed it, now, the Mardi Gras season itself is considered to be the carnival season. And if you are from Brazil or if you're familiar with Brazil, they have their equivalent of Mardi Gras called carnival. Now, carnival means the raising of flesh. It literally means the celebration of our carnal nature. Now, carnivals here where I live are typically like county fairs. There's not a whole lot of parades, but in Carnival in Brazil, as well as Mardi Gras in New Orleans and the surrounding areas, there are a lot of parades. In fact, from what I could find, there are over 60 parades. People who participate in these parades are often parts of crews, which again, we're gonna get into in a minute, or secret societies. They wear masks and they throw out beads. Now, in some places, women will lift their shirt up to get some beads. However, in my research, I have found that that's not really typical, that people will just throw out beads anyway. But the tradition of lifting up your shirt for beads leads us to a very interesting history. As I said, the whole idea of carnival is the idea of raising flesh or giving into carnal nature. And back in Roman times during these festivals, especially the celebration of Dionysus or Lupercalia, which is the Valentine's Day celebration that happens during the Mardi Gras season, which again, I'll link that below, the pagan priest would parade around town with their idols. These pagan priests, now again, this was long before the birth of Jesus, they would throw out herbs and money to the people. Now, in a lot of our deep dives over the Canaanites, especially over on the Dark Outpost, we've spoken about stuff like divine. These are practices we still see in Hollywood today. You can also call this, from their perspective, anointed. So in these festivals, a lot of times women or sacrificial women were on the altar and then some of them were the ones who were were sometimes given sometimes this would lead to the pagan priest then giving the family money basically and sometimes money is in the form of jewelry which is where we get the mardi gras beads today now today they're plastic they're cheap they're thrown out. They're, they're not like they were back in Roman times. But the idea of lifting up your shirt to get these beads does hail back from this idea of ritualistically women for blessings from the priest. Now, we have been told throughout our education, especially if you're from the Western world, Europe, America, Canada, even Australia, that when Christianity was introduced into the Roman Empire, that they kind of merged a lot of the old pagan celebrations with the Christian ones to help the people convert to this new religion. Well, breaking down the Council of Nicaea with Constantine in the fourth century, we know this is not true because Constantine himself outlawed a lot of the celebrations that were held in Jewish heritage. And since Christianity is supposed to be a form of Judaism or Judaism 2.0, we should have been then celebrating these Jewish celebrations. You see, the founding church fathers in the Roman Empire were not interested at all in turning our world in the West into a Christian world. In fact, they, will, they were infiltrating this new religion with their old satanic religion in order to keep the power manifested for their god, Lucifer. And in fact, I'm going to include a link down in the description box from the Church of Satan, where they basically tell you that this whole Mardi Gras celebration is satanic. It has got nothing to do with Lent. It's got nothing to do with Jesus at all. For the powers that be, again, as I said in the beginning, if your intention is through love and not to hurt anyone and to celebrate Jesus and God, I think it's fine. But for them, there was a very specific reason why they wanted this holiday put in the calendar. 
to generate energy for their gods and their gods, demons like the Nephilim, Dionysus, Pan, the half goaded god, and another one we're going to get to in a minute. So another aspect of Mardi Gras is mask wearing. In fact, I read that um, people that are in the parades on the floats are like required by New Orleans law to wear a mask. I thought that was interesting. If you know anything about that, let me know down in the comment section below. Now mask wearing was instituted by the French court when this area was still owned by the country of France, especially when it comes to masked balls. Now again, if you do follow the link to the Church of Satan's website, you will see that mask wearing is a huge part of satanic rituals. We saw this in the movie Eyes Wide Shut. Masks hide the identity of the person. Within the everyday human beings, we are taught that the ritual of wearing masks during Mardi Gras allows the different classes of people to associate with each other because the identity of the person is not disclosed behind a mask. We also know that when people wear masks, they're able to act a little bit more carnal because again, nobody knows who they are. Therefore, in their real life or their life after Mardi Gras, they will not be held accountable for carnal actions taken during this celebration. Now, a lot of the balls and dances that happen during the Mardi Gras season, even some, if not most of the parades, are put on by crews. Now, I told you we were gonna talk about crews. K-R-E-W-E. -E. We spoke about them a little bit in our last episode. Crews are considered mystic, secret societies. Now, some of these crews might be quite harmless today, but I guarantee you there are some that aren't. Now, the head of each crew is kept secret. Nobody knows the identity of the person who leads up each crew. And from my research, I found there are about 78 crews within New Orleans today. I will, again, leave a link to that website, the list of crews, in the description box down below. Now, most people, again, see the crews as basically just Mardi Gras organizers. They are responsible for, again, a lot of the parades, a lot of the floats, for hosting the balls, for really getting the party going during this roughly two-month season. Now, in order to go to a ball, a masked ball, for Mardi Gras, you have to be invited by one of the crews. If you're a part of the crew, obviously you're going to get invited, but they also will extend invitation to people in the community outside of their crew to come to the ball. These invitations are are done with great fanfare. Many of them are very ornate and beautiful in design. And within these invitations, there will be a little slip of paper that you bring with you to be able to get into the ball. Kind of like a secret handshake, but it's just like a secret piece of paper that you were given specifically from somebody in the crew. Now on each invitation, they will list the dress that they want you to wear. So whether it's a ball attired or costume or casual, that will be listed again on the invitation. Now here's something interesting as well. During these balls is where New Orleans has its debutantes. Now I am very familiar with debutantes. Sirens going off outside. Very, very interesting. I'm always curious as to what they're doing nowadays since the movie's getting getting quite intense. But anyway, I have experience with a debutante and I was asked to be a debutante after you, you, where I come from, the debutante, it's like your first year after college. You go to college for one year and then you get an invitation from the society ladies to be a debutante. I was asked to be a debutante. I was a ribbon bearer when I was like in the fifth grade. The little girls become ribbon bearers and hold ribbons for the debutantes as they walk through. I did that. But because of where I was in school and my life, I couldn't do the debutante when I was like 19 years old. My sister, however, got to do it. Not something I regret saying no to because 
in today's society, it's really just an excuse for a party. But for those who are not familiar with debutantes, debutantes are high society aristocratic balls and dances where fathers who are very usually very wealthy men in the in the community will debut their daughters. So they're saying that their daughters are now ready to be married off, basically. Of course, these come from the times during the tradition where women had dowries and all that kind of stuff. And where I grew up, the debutante ball still happens today. Now, even though you are asked to be a debutante, usually that means that your family is in really good standing in the community. You usually come from a pretty old money family, a good family here in the South, and the girls will wear white dresses and they are escorted out. Their names are put out over the speaker or whatever. We do our debutante ball at the local country club and you're kind of paraded around and then the rest of the night it's just a party and a celebration. Now again in modern times none of the rituals of the debutante, at least where I grew up, kind of held out. It was just an event. You know it's not like your dad was showing you off to society at 19 years old and you immediately were married off. No. No, no, no. All of my peers and friends I grew up with, they still had their choice of who they wanted to date. Most of them didn't get married for many, 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 many years later when they were done with school and ready to settle down. Again, it was just kind of this ceremony that is very much a part of the Southern heritage. So it's interesting that the debutantes are done in New Orleans during the Mardi Gras season. For us, it's usually done in the springtime, like towards the end of, of what would be the school year, so the end of May. But I'm sure, I'm sure that there's some nefarious stuff having to do with like the debutantes as well. I mean, you're literally giving your daughter away to society. I actually know who was on the committee to pick the girls of the debutantes when I was growing up and I know this because one of the people on the committee to pick the girls who were to be debutantes I'm actually related to, that's how I know, but it's kept a big secret. And again, you can't just be a debutante, like you have to be asked to be a debutante. And it's going to always be girls that come from very wealthy families in the community. Very, very interesting. And in fact, I know I just shared a couple of weeks ago, I shared my playlist where I dug into like the Savannah um, stories. And in the book, Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil that we spoke about on that series, they actually talk about the debutante ball there as well too. It's, it's a big deal. Like it's a super big deal in Southern towns, maybe not in big cities like Atlanta, but in traditionally Southern towns, the debutante ball is a huge freaking deal for your society, for your standing in society and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, they do that in New Orleans during Mardi Gras during these balls. So it, when I read that, like I had a lot of familiarity with these crews because again, the committee that picks debutantes where I grew up were always secret as well. You never knew who was actually on the committee that picked these girls, except again, I knew because one of my family members was on, on the committee. So usually these balls start off with what's called a tableau. I hope I'm saying that right. It's like a play. It's like a a gest a court gesture, like a, a comical pantomime. And members of the crew will be cast in this play to put this play on. And then after that, again, the king and the queen are ordained. The king and queen of the ball are ordained. And again, the debutantes are then brought out and offered up to the queen king and queen presented to them to then be presented to the New Orleans society. Now I can imagine that a lot of these crews from what I researched and what I know about debutantes are probably very very powerful people within New Orleans. Very wealthy people probably have a lot of heritage there and so again there's definitely that old southern aristocratic culture coming out in this ceremony. Now, speaking of crews, again, from what I found, there are about 78 crew, active crews in New Orleans. Some of them are what they call super crews. And they're super, super big and super, super powerful. One of these crews is called the Crew of Orpheus. Now, Orpheus was the musical son of Zeus. So I guess like Dionysus' brother, 
Now again, like we said in part one, Dionysus' mother was human, like Orpheus's mother was human. These Greek gods that we were taught were just mythological stories, it now seems were most likely Nephilim. Now again, I'm not going to go too much into detail about that part of the story because we did cover that last week and if you missed it again part one is in the description box below. Now the crew of Orpheus was founded in 1993 by Harry Connick Jr. and his father Harry Connick Sr. along with the New Orleans district attorney. Upon its founding there were about 700 members of this super crew. And today, there are 1,500 members. Now, this super crew, the crew of Orpheus, the Nephilim of music, founded by Harry Connick Jr. and his dad, along with the district attorney of New Orleans, is known for its floats in the parade. In fact, today, they have about 38 floats. Some of the more notable floats in their parade are the Four foot long dragon and the 139 foot Orpheus Leviathan. No joke, I shit you not. The Orpheus Leviathan. If you know your Bible, you know what a Leviathan is. If you were joining us for all of our missing and banned books of the Bible, we literally just talked about the Leviathan in the Apocalypse of Abraham. This is the serpent of destruction owned by Lucifer. And they have a 139 foot float called the Orpheus Leviathan. Not only that, but again, this crew was founded by a very famous musician from New Orleans, along with the district attorney. But it gets better than that. So let's talk about some of the Orpheus monarchs of past. Now, monarch we know is like a king or a queen, but it also comes from the monarch butterfly, which is tied to... So these Orpheus monarchs include Quentin Tarantino, Sandra Bullock, Glenn Close, Whoopi Goldberg, Anne Rice, and Toby Keith. If that doesn't shout out red flag, then I don't know what does. So I guess the whole point of this, as I started saying in the beginning, are there people out there today that are a part of this dark CULT that are harnessing the energy of Mardi Gras to do very nefarious things? Are they putting all this stuff out in the open for us to see? Are they telling us that they're doing it? Yeah, they sure are. But that doesn't mean that every single person that participates in Mardi Gras is doing these things or is associated with this group of people. And I do believe that when we flip into a new timeline and these people are no longer allowed to exist on our plane, we, the people, the good people, the people of the light, will be able to reclaim some of these cultural celebrations for the good for the love and for humanity. All right, so let me know your thoughts and your opinions down in the comment section below. I love hearing everybody's experiences with New Orleans. Again, I don't think you should stop celebrating if it's part of your heritage. Just because some nefarious people want to make everything bad doesn't mean it has to be bad. We can reclaim that with our intention. Our next deep dive is going to be over Anne Rice. I am still very much working on a big series on Voodoo and Marie Laveau. We will probably end our series on New Orleans on that topic because it's a really big one and there's a lot there and I really want to make sure I do it justice and do it right. And so I'm really trying to work on that for a long period of time before I present it to you guys. So the next deep dive again will be Anne Rice. Rice. All right, guys, thank you so much to Josh McKay for doing our music. If you would like to purchase the full song, there is 
always a link down in the description box below. Thank you to Todd Broderick for helping me get this video out to you guys. And thank you guys so much for being a part of this journey and for just being awesome and being so kind to each other. And I, I'm literally so grateful to everyone that's a part of this this channel and a part of this community because honestly, you go and look at other channels and there's like bickering in the comment section and you guys really keep it classy and you keep it kind, you keep it funny and I just could not be more grateful to each and every one of you. We are seriously a little family and we are seriously walking into the light together. Hold the line and know my friends, that the best is truly yet to come. God bless you all, and I will talk to you soon. Bye.